Asking you guys, what's the first concert you ever went to? <sighs> Metal concert or concert? Any kind. What was my first concert concert? I think it was Men at Work. Who can it be for now? the second record, for the second record, yeah. I had a kid in school with me, had tickets, and he asked me if I wanted to go. So that was my first concert concert. My first metal concert was Dio, Last in Line Tour with, uh, what's his um, sister? Mine was with Twisted. That was my first concert, metal concert was uh, mine, Dio. And I think it was Twisted Sister. Mine was wasn't with Twisted Sister, it was with Dokken, I think. I think it was uh, Dio and Dokken, I think. But it was definitely the Last in Line Tour. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I saw it at the Coliseum, I think. Twisted Sister and Dio. Yeah, that's probably the one the same show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw it at Meadowlands. So that's probably why I had the different support. <laughs> so Dio was your first? Yeah, I think that was my first, you know, big rock concert, if I'm not mistaken. And I think my first underground show was Dark Angel Possessed at CBGB's. That was like the first underground oh, yeah. club show, you know, which was like first time at CBGB's, first time seeing, you know, bands like that. And I was like just blown away because they're like, right there and although CBGB's was like the look of the place wasn't the best but the sound system they had was like incredible so it always sounded really really cool and I'll never forget Possessed I think I hear the drums facing sideways because <laughs> oh I remember you told me <laughs> the size yeah. of the drums yeah. maybe or just the way he did oh, it's it it's a but, small stage CBGB's yeah. so yeah it was, it was pretty interesting you know but uh yeah it was great that my was first underground show. first underground show at Lam was at Lemoore that was in 86 and that was Exodus Bonded by Blood uh, tour and they had Carnivore, Nuclear Assault, Agent Steel, and Blessed Death support. Wow. And that was like my first like underground show. And that show, fucking uh, Paul Bailoff, something happened and he got sick or something and he didn't perform that night. So they played the whole Bonabai by Blood album instrumental. Um, and Gary Holt just got up there and, and introduced the songs and talked to the crowd. Dude, it was fucking amazing. <laughs> it was fun. Like, the whole crowd was singing along. Like, we were all singing the lyrics, you know? It was fucking awesome. And that was my first, like, you know, underground metal show. It was awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, none of those other bands had albums out. Carnivore didn't have a record out. Nuclear Assault didn't have. They didn't put out the EP yet. Um, Blessed Death, the first time I heard of them. And Agent Steel, they, they weren't really on my radar. But, <laughs> you know, but the other bands fucking fire. Yeah. What I remember about the CB show was Gene Holden's drum set took up, like, half the stage. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the stage is small there. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a tiny yeah, stage. Fucking, yeah. yeah. Uh, first album that you bought, and do you remember where? Oh, my God. First album? Like, yeah. I think Blondie was the first album. <laughs> the actual first vinyl I think I bought when I was a kid. Um, as far as metal goes, oh, man. Because there's been so much of that, it's hard to remember that one. Yeah. ACDC, I know I got a lot of ACDC Van Halen back in the day. It's like first rock kind of stuff, you know? Um, obviously, Dio was probably one of the earlier ones. Definitely. I think my first... I used to, like, be into soundtracks when I was a kid. So, like, I had, like... Uh, I would get cassettes of, like, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, mm -hmm. like, movie soundtrack, Star Wars soundtrack. Yep. Oh, yeah, we'd get all the soundtracks. Like, from they had, like... Uh, uh, there was like that. Remember that weird kind of Star, Star Wars? Wars one? Yeah, it was yeah, disco it was Star Wars. Like Miko, oh, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Remember it, it was, was like, disco, like and they, disco Star Wars. They had a whole Wars. album just of yeah. Star Wars music, but yeah. like disco like, and it was like, I, yeah. I'll never forget that. I that had that Grease. That was like one of my first. Grease. <laughs> <laughs> Grease. I, I fucking loved that Absolutely. shit when I was a Grease kid. Lightning. And then when I got older, like some of the first like cassettes I bought back then, like that were you know non like soundtrack stuff was like. Um, Queen, the game, you know, we got another one bites dust and you know all that stuff on it, and uh, Pink Floyd, the Wall. I had that on cassette, like it was like I think a double cassette, I think. So those were like the first albums that I remember buying, like in you know younger years when I was young that I actually bought, you know. And then later on, you know, like Bob said, it was probably stuff like, you know, Pyromania, Def Leppard, and then Dio and Maiden stuff, you oh, know, yeah, like Maiden, Maiden stuff, yeah. Because yeah. Maiden, like, I, like, when I first saw, like, the artwork on some of those Maiden covers, because, oh, you know, back then yeah. it was only vinyl. So you'd go into a place like Crazy Eddie, which was like an electronic store. Yeah, I remember. I remember Crazy Eddie, right? But you'd went in there and they had, like, Before a... Before we went to jail. Oh, that's yeah, right, yeah. Fraud, yeah, fail. 
But anyway, you'd go in there and they had like a sick vinyl department and you actually would go in there and they'd have metal shit. So you'd see like whatever, like first made now and there'd be like, like a whole shit ton of them. Then they'd have like, you know, um, I remember they'd have like Merciful Fate, see like Melissa and Don't Break the Oath and all this vinyl shit that was just out, you know, it was like <laughs> sick. So uh, anyway, but those were the ones, probably the first ones I got that I can remember, you know. Do you remember the transition to metal? Like how it happened for you? Huh. I think it was kind of a natural thing. Like yeah. you had your ACDC and Van Halen and Led Zeppelin. Yeah, Van Halen, like Pink opinion. Floyd. Yeah. And then just eventually the Priest and the Maiden and stuff yeah. came about and you started hearing different stuff. And, you know, on my block, you know, I had a, there was a lot of kids and they were definitely the older kids and, you know, they'd kind of be into the Maidens and stuff like that. So yeah. you kind of hear it and get, get into it. And, yeah, it just progressed from there. And then, you know, once I had a friend from Brooklyn that family friends that said, hey, we're going to see you know, Ron James Dio, whatever, and I was like, so I started listening to that and getting into that, and I'll never forget, once I saw that concert, and obviously I was familiar with them and, and Twisted Sister, and when that first concert, like, seeing that, and just the whole production, and just everything, I was like, I, I think I was just hooked after that, it was, <laughs> it was like, you see that, yeah, you're, you're experiencing all that music live, and that was it for me, it's like, I, I got so into it at that point, so. What do you consider to be, like, the first underground record you got? Underground. Well, at the time, it was like um, Metallica was kind of underground at yeah, the time. Yeah, you know? Metallica was like when Ride the Lightning came out. Yeah, that was like, you know, what the hell? You know, like it was so so for that time, it was so heavy. Like fight fire with fire. You were like, what the yeah, fuck dude. is this? You know, and that the you know with the bass drums and the guitar, like everything was just like it was like nothing else. I mean, yeah. that album was and it was just, just like, so you know just you know just yeah. aggressive. You know, because you you would go from like Maiden and Priest and get back to the last question like. Back then, if you remember, dudes would have, like, shit painted on their jackets on the denims, you know? So you'd always see, like, and Maiden was, or you'd always see Maiden and Saxon yep. on the back, painted on the back of jackets. About Saxon. But yeah. sick, though. Like, they, they were done, like, it was almost like the album covers were replicated perfectly yep. on the back. And uh, I remember it was a kid at school when I was in, like, grade school, and he had, like, the first Maiden cover on his denim jacket. And that was the first time I saw that. And that first time Maiden was on my radar, I was like, wow that's sick you know and you're always like what does that sound like that's, I gotta hear that you know what I'm saying and then later on when I got it I was like wow that's awesome you know so that kind of shit is what put it on the map for me when you'd see the jackets and like what the fuck is that you know the curiosity you yeah, know yeah. and then I'm sorry what was the uh, well I was gonna say like everybody had like killers or number of the beast sure. on jacket yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, and you know, the Saxon jacks, jackets and, you know, whatever. But you'd always saw sick jackets at shows, man. Or we used to go to the to the flea market on Sunday. You'd always oh, totally. see dudes walking around with, like, sick, like, you know, peace of mind and shit like that. Like, wow, that's sick, And that's you where know? we get all the records. Like, I'll, I'll yeah. forget when, when Power Slate came out, for instance, that's where I got it, at that flea market. Yeah. There'd be a couple of guys that sold, you know, strictly the metal stuff. And they'd always have the cool vinyls and t-shirts and everything. So we'd yeah. always go by. There. And they had bootlegs, too. I got, like, a double vinyl, the uh, Peace of Mind tour. And it had the the uh, tour book on the cover with the, uh, uh, what the fuck was it? Was It was, like, Eddie, like, fucking. Oh, with the planet thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But they had a, a double vinyl of uh, one of the shows from New York. And I bought it at the flea market. There's so many bootlegs. And it, was, it wasn't legit. But, man, that was sick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, shit like that. <laughs> All right. Um, what was the first riff that you tried to learn to play? Oh, gotta oh. be like "Smoke on the Water." Yeah, <laughs> that was probably one of the first. Yeah, ones. Totally. guitar. When you're learning guitar, it's the easiest thing to play. You know, <laughs> that was for me too. And it's classic. It sounds great, and it's easy. So, like, I'll never forget one of the guys I, on my block showed that to me, and yeah, that, that's definitely I think, the first riff I learned. Did you play guitar before you played bass? No, I played no. bass. I had a I had a, a close friend at the time, uh, Francis. And he had a bass, and he played bass, and he was much better than me. He had been playing for, you know, a little bit longer than, <laughs> than me. And I remember just going over to his house, and I was like, oh, sick. And I didn't even really know the difference between a bass and a guitar at that point. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's You're sick. like, I get the four-string guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so he would just show me stuff. And, you know, once he showed me how to play Smoke on the Water. Oh, and... Um, you can't stop rock and roll by Twisted Sister. That and there were a couple other things, real simple shit that he showed me. And then like once I started like learning how to play a little bit better, better, <laughs> you know, it was like it was like shit, you know. But then 
we would try to like learn some Maiden stuff. Like I remember it was a big deal. Like he learned how to play the beginning of Killers because like, you know, to play the two okay. couple of strings yeah. at the same time was like, wow, you know? <laughs> so he's like, yo, dude, check this out. And he showed me how to play that. And I was like, I thought I was a superstar. I was like, wow, I can play the beginning part of Killers. You know, it was so cool. But that's how it started for oh, me. Yeah. And like just learning and having him show me and just holding an instrument and, and hearing it, you know, it was like so cool. Like the coolest shit in the world for me. So I was hooked instantly, you know? What about singing? Like, what got you into that? What, well, what happened <laughs> was uh, I was forced into that. Like, yeah, and I was just like, all right, you're the singer. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because when I when I you know when they asked me to join, it was originally Rigor Mortis. Yeah, because Andrew had just left the band, so they're like, hey, we need a bass player, you know. So I said, oh, yeah, because I love Rigor Mortis, and I used to go down to the rehearsals. That's how I met these guys. I knew Andrew, the, the bass player singer, before I knew these guys because he used to hang out with our crew. So uh, when he left, they asked me to join. I was like, cool. So I was like, cool, I'll play bass, you know. And uh, it was like two weeks before our first show, we were playing at Blondie's in Nyack, New York, and our old guitar player was, I guess he was gonna be singing, and like right before, two weeks before the show, these guys were like, hey, guess what, you're gonna be singing now because uh, you know Tom's gonna concentrate on guitar. <laughs> I was like, cool, awesome. Now I, now I have to learn how to play bass and sing. Yeah. <laughs> so. so how was that for you? Like, you gotta practice a lot, I guess? Yeah, dude, I still, <laughs> even now, you know what I'm saying? You know, I'm, I don't consider myself a great player, so I have to really practice. Before we go on tour, he knows, I'm like a month month before I'm playing, I'm like practicing, get, making sure my vocals are where they need to be, and especially with the new material, because I'm never recording the bass and vocals at the same time in the studio. Usually we learn the, the stuff, and I play the bass, and then I do the vocals yeah. at the end, and then after the album's done, I, I go home, and then I'm like, okay, what songs are we playing live? And that's where I really put it together, so. So it's always a learning curve for me just trying to get the shit down and make sure I'm doing it right so yeah. um, is there a song that you don't like to play live there might be a few of them actually <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it there's a lot I can't remember that. I mean you know it's just that there's certain songs I guess that work better live than others so you know not that we don't like playing them it's just like you know some are just uh, too too much for, for for the live venue you know what I mean at least at least quirky, it feels yeah. that way you know the quirky ones so we always you know, we try and stick with stuff that we know over the years has gone over well and it's easy to digest live, you know what I mean? So, um, so there's anything, a few songs. Anything prior to the new record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, like, how you come about with your set list? Then. That's the worst part of our career yeah. is trying to come up with a set list because yeah. with every record, it gets harder and harder because you got yeah. more songs now thrown onto the fucking pile. Yeah. So, so now it's like, all right, what do we do? Obviously, yeah, this is the tour for the new record, so we want to do a lot of new stuff, and we're really into the new stuff, and it's, you know, we feel it's strong, and it's going to do well live, so we want to play it. But then you have to come up with the old stuff, and you want to try and do stuff that, you know, maybe something different, but then also you want to do stuff that, you know, certain ones that you know are still going to go well. So it's it's a pain in the ass, actually. So <laughs> No, it's horrible. But it's, it's tough. It's tough. My, it's one of my least favorite things. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> but you don't deviate from the set list, right? It's the same for every show on the tour? In the past, we did. We, we used to mix well, it up, and know, that yeah. just becomes, yeah. you know, harder than, than you know, just this this tour, we're like, let's just get a set list. That's going to be the set list, you know. I hate to, you know, I like to have it down up here because, one, my eyes suck now at my age. So, like, to look down and, like, read the set list is, like, murderous for me, <laughs> especially if it's dark. He might, so. think, see, he might see a different song title. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know. It, it's actually kind of funny when I print out my set list, like like the font is like, <laughs> yeah, it's like like four sheets Everyone's of paper for like, like ten this. songs. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's like, got like four pieces of paper. Across so the yeah, so it's better if I have it up here. And how much uh, prep time do you need before tour? For me, I like to give yeah, at least month, month. at least a month for me. Wow. Yeah, just mm -hmm. like, and that's not every day, you know. If I do four days a week to five days a week like you know going through the set you know and reviewing stuff i'm happy with that but I, at least a month i never like cut it closer than that you know sometimes longer for this one i started like playing all the new record and getting that you know to where it needed to be first so i had about a month before and then once we got the set list kind of settled in i just kind of started working on that but yeah at least a month Yeah, because the older songs a lot of times even if you haven't played it for a year or two or maybe we did it on tour three years ago they kind of come back to you pretty quick, you know, when you've been doing them, at least within the past few years. But the new stuff is the hardest, you know, because yeah. mm -hmm. just like the vocals, like with the solos and stuff, you have to kind of like learn, relearn those. Once yeah. you put them down, you got to learn them, you know, and then you have to learn them to play live because no matter how much you practice before you hit yeah, that stage, when you're on the stage, it's a different, totally different animal, you know. So you might know how to play it, but you have to get used to playing it on stage, like in that mode, you know what I mean? And 
So it takes some time. It does take some time. It's true. You can, you're a total superstar when you're at home in your in your own space. <laughs> yeah, like, man, yeah. I fucking rock this shit. And then you get on stage like, wow, I suck balls. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Hell. I really need to practice. <laughs> so have you reached a point where like you say to yourself, this is the production sound we want? Like you're happy now? Yeah. Well, every record's a challenge, man. I mean, it's just sure. like we learn as we go and, uh, you know, it's... You try and listen for everything and the problem is that, you know, sometimes when you're you're listening, you're listening and you just get so burnt out on it, you know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, luckily, you know, between Paul and, and then especially Zach, as uh, Zach Oren's mixing and mastering everything, you know, he's a professional, so he gets it to kind of like where it needs to be and then we just kind of like tweak it and kind of give our, our input of, as far as what we think it needs to go, certain things need to come up, down, or whatever, but it's 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 tough, you know, it's it's not easy. It's a... Luckily now we have separation between when we're finished, you know, yeah. tracking and mixing. That helps a lot. We had we went into the studio the August first. By August fifteenth, we were done with all the trackings. So everything was recorded at that point, except for some of the leads. But the mixing didn't like finish up until like almost the first or second week of October. So that was the times so we had over a month or two, you know, to kind mm -hmm. of you know, separate from, you know, the songs and then jump back into the mix. So we had about nine rounds of mixes with Zach. And, and you know, so Zach, will, the way it works is he'll, once we send him all the files, he'll send us like the first round, which is rough, but that's just kind of, you know, so we could kind of hear where we are, starting point. And then we tweak it. You know, each mix after that, we tweak something, you know, drums, uh, guitars, this, that, you know, until we finally get there. So this this album was about nine or ten rounds of, of mixes. And then when we got to the point where we're at now, we were just like, okay, let's call it there. Because if we dick around anymore, we're going to fuck it up. Because sometimes you could, you know... you can, yeah, you don't want to overdo it. You could overdo you know? it, you know, and that's the problem, you know? You don't want to overthink it, you know? Yeah. It's like, Do you have a favorite production and a least favorite of all your albums? This is one of my favorite, I think. Definitely. I think this and I, I, I this one and the last one were definitely a couple yeah. of my favorites. Least favorite, harnessing. Yeah. Harnessing. Yeah. It sounded great, but when it got mastered, I don't know what happened. Yeah. It just fucking lost all the balls and the fullness, and it just got very weird sounding. So that's my least favorite. Okay. There's only a couple of questions left. I know you guys. No, that's go. fine. Uh, for Ross, name three bassist vocalists that you like. Oh, wow. <sighs> bassist vocalists. Let me see. Well, it could be either or, I guess. All right, there's a lot of fucking amazing players. Like, as bass players, I would say Alex Webster is just a phenomenal bass player. You know, one of the best, in my opinion. Uh, such a humble dude, but just such a fucking monster on the bass, you know. Insp inspiring as fuck, man. Just awesome. Um, Mikey from Origin is another fucking amazing bass player. Like, just sick, sick bass player. Um, and uh, I'd have to say, for me... I have to mention Steve Harris at the top of that list because he was the guy that really kind of inspired me uh, and got me into playing bass, you know, because that was the first stuff that I really kind of started to analyze. And, you know, all of ba Maiden stuff is so bass heavy. It's easy to kind of follow the bass and, 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 uh, and understand what he's doing, you know. And I just love his playing, you know. We just fucking sick player, man. So, so you know, uh, Harris would be the guy that kind of got me into playing and... In our in our scene, you know Webster, Mikey. I mean, there's there's a fucking million great yeah, place yeah. players. You know who are just I, when I watch, I'm just like, oh, win, <laughs> just fucking throw <laughs> right my base away, you know. But uh, but they're both uh, both Mikey and Alex are just such fucking great players and just such humble dudes, you know, and just fucking yeah, just dudes you watch and like, oh, fuck, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, vocalist, vocalist. Um, wow, huh? I'm trying to think. Uh, I like a lot of, you know, I actually liked, um, let me see. I liked Chris Gamble from fucking Gorephobia. had some sick vocals back in the day. I liked early Paradise Lost vocals, demo, mm -hmm. demo, that mm -hmm. sick heavy fucking style. Um, I loved, uh, LG from Entombed. He had sick vocals on the Nihilist stuff and on the into early Entombed stuff. Um... I liked Mike Browning's vocals. They were a little different, but they were just raspier and sick. And that early, that first Morbid Angel stuff was just always just, just sick, you know, his vocals. Um, who else? Um, just trying to think of like just sick, heavy shit that I liked back in the day. Um, 
uh, we were just talking about Wagner from Sargophago, but he had some sick vocals back then. Um, and Andrew from Rigor Mortis. Sack had some fucking sick vocals, yeah. man. And I'm just going with guys that were like just sick and deep and guttural and heavy, but just sounded really cool, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So I think that covers the gamut there with fucking, you know, <laughs> demo stuff to like dudes put out records to earlier stuff, so. But there's a million more. I mean, that's just off the top of my head, you know, trying to think. And Bob, I guess, uh, guitarist? Oh, I mean, I just go with like influences like Dave Murray from Aiden was probably my number one, you know, influence for sure. Um, Glenn Tipton, Priest, you know, that stuff. Those, those, all those guys in those bands, Adrian Smith, you know, KK Downing, like those, that, those teams were like some of my favorite, Priest and Maiden. Uh, of course, Kirk Hammett, Metallica, you know, I always loved the way his style and how things sounded, you know, very melodic, but very cool at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's some of my you know, more of the influential stuff, I think that really had a big kind of like uh, effect on me for sure. What about the great cat? The great cat. <laughs> you don't remember that crazy bitch? Oh no, I remember, but I'm like, <laughs> not an influence off black. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, favorite Texas bands? Well, we, we're Spider very tight. Holy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paul at the show tonight. <laughs> We are, well, we're tight with fucking Jeff, Jeff Tandy, and, yeah. you know, I liked all the stuff he did, you know, he was all over the map with the uh, Versafira, the black metal mm -hmm. stuff, um, uh, Birth AD, which was like the sick, you know, pissed off thrash, you know, the good thrash, and uh, he's got a band Trenchant now that's actually <clears throat> really good, you know, more like that sick black death kind of stuff, you know, so that's some, some great stuff, Imprecation, um, let me see, I'm trying to think of some older stuff, um, Nickerboard. Necrovoir? Necrovoir, yeah. Can't forget Necrovoir, yeah. man. We met John back in 88 when he came up with Morbid Angel. You remember that? And, uh, yeah, I mean, that was such a fucking sick fucking rehearsal demo back in the day, man. It was fucking awesome. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> All right. And these are the last two questions. Not mine. Um, for Ross, will you ever bring back the mustache? Eh, probably not. <laughs> I don't think that was a good look, you know, you know. Maybe for well, you apparently know. it's the new the looks back. <laughs> the looks back, but you know, not, like, for but me. not for me. Not for me, yeah. Yeah, I have an old picture I think it was a Dark Angel show and you're in the background. It's behind uh, me and Lisa. I don't remember Ed's old girlfriend Lisa. Yes. Lisa, yeah. Yes. And you're in the background, you had that famous stash at the time. Oh man. <laughs> what was I thinking back then? <laughs> Fail. <laughs> okay, and for Bob, um, who do you think, besides you, has the best uh, moves on stage while playing your instrument? Oh, man. <laughs> best moves on stage while... Well, I'm going to say Barney from Napalm Death, because he plays his instruments, the mic, and that guy, yeah. <laughs> he goes for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's a horrible yeah. player. Yeah, that's a good good answer, man. Yeah. Barney is fucking is, crazy on stage, man. He's fucking he unique, crazy. man. Absolutely. We saw him at the Decibel Metal and Beer Fest in September, man. Man, he was just nonstop the whole show. Like, he was just fucking running around the yeah. stage, like, constantly, man. So, yeah, man. Props to Barney, man. Good dude. Fucking great front man, you know. And he's about the right shit. Good for him, man. Yep. <laughs> Scott from Ripping Corpse is kind of like that. All over his Yeah, head. Scott was a fucking great front man. Yeah. That was a great band, too, man. All right, that's about it. I know you guys got to get going. It's oh. 9.35. Yeah. That was painless. <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot. All right. <laughs>